So joining me on stage, we have a panel of experts. You look very comfortably seated, I have to say. I'm a little bit jealous. And our moderator for this session will be Daniel Cade. You may remember Daniel from the first award last night. So I shall hand over to Daniel's capable hands for our panel session. Please welcome Daniel in the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, first of all, to introduce myself, I am a consultant. I work in the area of sport and sustainability. Um, sustainability meaning focusing generally on the areas of social, environmental and governance aspects of, of managing uh, sport governing bodies, clubs, leagues and so on. Um, and I think I'm, I'm at the time in my career when I can say I've been around a while, I've been around a bit, and I've seen some good things and I've seen some bad things. And I think generally I can say I've seen progress in the sport industry in, in terms of social responsibility and sustainability, but it's occasionally a bit slow uh, and it's occasionally a bit frustrating. And I think the thing that, that reminds me that, that I keep coming back to, there's a couple of things really, and, and one is that I used to play a lot of football. You know, I, I think I am who I am today because I played football, because of the values that I, that I, that I learned through football. And, and the second thing is that I also was a coach and I was very aware while I was a coach of the influence I had on the, on the children that I was coaching in, in the football team. And, you know, so I, I think it's, not that I want to talk about myself right here, right now, but I want to bring it back to, I think, why we're here um, is really the, the positive social uh, potential as a driving force of social change that sport has, especially in this area um, of inclusion. And that's why we're having it today in the sport light. Very clever title. Um, so um, we've had a pandemic. Um, and obviously there's, as a result of that being a lack of opportunity to play sport, um, but the pandemic has also acted like a, a magnifying glass. In, in some cases it's highlighted, in, in other cases it's worsened the impact um, that we see of, of, of exclusion, for example. Um, and in fact, some have ob observed that we have had a syndemic, so sort of a systematic or sy systemic pandemic. Uh, a syndemic is where those that have underlying health conditions are more exposed to the, to the virus. And, and as a result of that, that, those that have an underlying health conditions are those that have social determinants, such as uh, disabilities, ethnicity, uh, and, and lower income. So what does this mean? Essentially, it means that sport has a role to play here. Uh, sport has a role to address the intersectionality of these issues um, that are causing health problems in our society today um, and have been exposed really badly during the pandemic. Um, and we're here in this session, we're in this session to, to understand uh, why sport has not included these people in the past, why there are groups in society that have been excluded and we, we're going to spend a bit more time on, on how they can be included, what lessons we can learn and take forward with us uh, to implement pro programs and projects in the future, perhaps things that we've learned during the pandemic in, in, in the last two years that we can take with us um, and implement into projects in the future. And to help us with that, we have a fantastic and patient uh, panel uh, who I'm about to introduce. From, from my left here, we have Nagin Ravand, uh, who's an Afghan football coach and entrepreneur who came to Denmark aged three. Uh, she has started several girls and women's football departments to ensure equal access on the football pitch. And today she's using her voice and resources to empower the female minorities in her community. Welcome, Nagin. Thank you. And next to Nagin, we have Dylan Richardson. Dylan is the World Power, pa Powerlifting Performance and Development Manager, a bit of a mouthful, um, at the International Paralympic Committee. Uh, and in his role, he is responsible to grow the sport in different areas, to deliver programs to engage athletes, coaches, and referees from member countries around the globe. 
Dylan is the lead behind key initiatives, including She Can Lift, uh, a targeted program to increase women's participation and leadership and raise the bar together, an online competition format to provide accessible opportunities during the pandemic. So welcome to you too, Dylan. And then we have Lucy, Lucy Mills. Uh, Lucy is a program manager for, for the foundation of Football Club Barcelona. She is in her fourth season at Barca where she manages sport-based social inclusion programs for refugees and migrants in Europe and in the Middle East. Uh, Lucy is also a board member and advisor to several local and international initiatives that promote football for girls and women. So welcome to you too, Lucy. And next to Lucy is Rosina. Rosina Spinoy is a design strategist and social entrepreneur. Uh, she runs her own NGO and SME based in Brussels um, and working internationally. Rosina champions a variety of causes, projects, and philanthropic activities ranging from gender, equality, urban placemaking, inclusion, and diversity. Uh, and through advocating for more mental health awareness, uh, inclusive communities, and co-designing processes in her wide range of diverse projects. Welcome to you too, Rosina. And lastly, we have Arlena. Arlena Daragas is a passionate fighter for a more accessible and safe environment for LGBTQI plus people in sports. She lives in Ghent, Belgium, so not too far away, um, and works for Bel Jong Niet Kitad Hero. Good job. <laughs> uh, a Belgium uh, youth LGBTQ plus non-profit uh, organization. For the past six years, she's been coaching, guiding, and educating uh, young people in organizing activities, projects, and initiatives. And in 2016, she co-founded Out for the Win, an organization who aims to normalize LGBTQI plus people in sports through storytelling and education. So a final welcome to you too, Alina. Thank you. Um, so I, I also wanted to say again as well, brother, thank you to our keynote speakers. I think we can take many messages from, uh, from Magin and from Lars, who really helped, especially Lars in that last discussion, to set the scene. And, and for me, the, the sort of takeaway there was we can socially integrate in many different situations. And I think what we need to do, specifically what you guys perhaps are going to tell us about, is how we can do that in our projects, in the projects that we are implementing in our specific roles in sport, uh, and, and really to innovate in doing so. It's, it's, not that the, it, it's, it's not that these people cannot be included, it's really how they can be included and how can we think of innovative ways to be, to be able to include them. But first I wanted to take a step back uh, and, and to build a picture of the issue for, for the audience. And I want to ask you each, one by one, perhaps starting with you, Nagin, if you could tell us uh, how or why the groups that you represent have been excluded so far. And, and feel free to consider those soft uh, forms of inclusion, such as cultural or religious uh, reasons, as well as the hard, so the visible or physical or structural um, forms of exclusion as well. Okay, well, that was a big question. <laughs> I think there are many different ways in which minorities, especially women with migrant background, gets excluded from the communities, the unions, the different societies. And personally, myself, growing up in Denmark with a refugee background, with parents who know nothing but Afghan culture, we needed someone to reach out, which we never got. And not only did we need people who could reach out to us and explain to us how things work in Denmark, how the union life actually plays quite a big role in you know, development and sh socializing. There were barriers such as the cost of what it, you know, what's the price to play football and have fun? Do we even consider that? Do we consider that not only migrants, refugees, but also people who might not have the econ economy to play football how can they be a part of playing on the pitch if we have such a high cost? How can we ensure that a football club does not exist unless we, unless we do an active you know, 
effort to include both genders. Two football departments in my local neighborhood in Denmark had zero female members. How is that even possible in Denmark? I come from Afghanistan where women and girls like Kalida explained to us very well, do not have the opportunity to dream of playing football. So you would not expect my parents to ever consider the fact that their girl should play football, not because I'm not allowed, not because they think it's bad, but because they've never had the image of girls playing. So where would they get the inspiration? Where is the representation? Where are the many people in positions of power and responsibility that includes those who do not look like the majority, those who do not believe in what the majority believes in. It's first and foremost, a structural problem. We need to start including us in decision-making processes because we know what parents, first generation, second generations think. It's very difficult to try and understand something if you're not out there yourself. We have a lot of volunteers, I will make it short. We have very many different you know, souls of fire that does a tireless effort out on the field while those who decide sit at city council. How will we ever understand if we're not brought in, if we are not in a panel like this where people actually can hear us and we're given a voice, then the structure can never change. But the thing is, when we finally speak up and we get the chance to sit here, you really need to listen. Not only listen, but after also, you know, take action. So, you know, economy, access, all these things, they can be solved with money. But the real problem is representation. The real problem is giving us the courage to keep going because we can see we're going somewhere and not just, you know, working tireless in a dark circle. So, yeah. There's a lot of problems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nagin, don't worry about the time right now. We're, we're relaxed. We're, you know, take your time. We're good. Um, Dylan, to you. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'll focus on two things. Uh, structural, I think, with people with disabilities, uh, it's transportation, it's accessibility in venues, it's uh, access to sp specialized sport equipment, uh, access to support staff. So the, the practical things of, uh, that are creating barriers for people with disabilities uh, in accessing sport or physical activity uh, exist uh, through these things. And then on the other side of the coin, more social, it's cultural of uh, based on which country you're in, if, uh, how you see uh, integration of people with disabilities uh, in daily life, whether it's in, a, uh, in specialized schools, in specialized programs that are integrated uh, together, I think, and then integrated or with this thought of sport at all. Um, so yeah, these are the things I would highlight with this. Uh, mm -hmm. Short and sweet. Yeah, thanks Dylan. Uh, I'll cut in quickly before we go to Lucy and I'll say that we will have questions. Um, so, and there will be microphones coming around. So think of your questions as we're going through and we'll come to, the, come to you afterwards. Lucy. Thanks. Um, hi everyone. This is my first ISCA event and I'm, I hopefully it won't be my last. Um, you really know how to do a Congress. Um, yeah, I think just on a, on a macro level, Barca Foundation, we work on a, on a global scale. Um, and there are conscious and unconscious biases um, coupled with or, or underpinned by um, factless and inaccurate uh, biases and perceptions and understanding, understandings of people and society. Then we have, of course, a rigid sports structure that historically has been binary, that um, was developed and designed by and for men many years ago. And of course, this system is changing slowly and many of you in the room are driving this change. Um, but I think the, for, it goes back to the, the design of, of projects and just, you know, you, you guys are unpicking the specifics of that, but and challenging ourselves as to, as to listening and understanding those biases, whether they're unconscious or not. And, and um, yeah, I think that, that, that I like to go back to the design of projects um, as a starting point to, to understand the, the systemic exclusion that we, we're seeing everywhere. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lucy. Yeah, Rosina, please. Um, <clears throat> thanks for asking, and it's good to be here and to see you all. I think a lot of the points have been touched on for sure. I mean, I think there's a lot of um, systemic issues for sure. We need to be seeing 
people like us, as Nagin also touched on, within boards, in leadership positions, within the clubs. Um, and also, I mean, I recall myself, I mean, I think it was over like 20 years ago and being a woman of colour and doing karate and being told, oh, this is a man's sport, what are you doing? You know, and it wasn't sort of validated until I won the sort of nationals and came home with a black eye. And so really then it's like, oh, okay, this is serious. Um, and then the other aspect I think is, you know, I also have a son with mental health challenges and who's neurodiverse and the challenges we have faced um, to find clubs, to find that accessibility for him to be included within a club. I mean, over summer, it was like two hours of a drive going, two hours of a drive coming back to take him for a week. And that sense of belonging, that sense of being part of community, we need to really rethink the way we do things. We need to work in a more collaborative and more community oriented way where we are thinking of the society and people around us and be inclusive of that. And a lot of that comes down to, as I said, really being open. Inclusive isn't even necessarily having a special club just for children or youth that are um, neurodiverse or have challenges or, or you know, psychosocial disabilities. It's about how do we integrate? How do we have youth as being part of mainstream clubs? And how can mainstream clubs and sports centers be open for that? And a big part of that is education. And I think we really need to work on the education side as well and to understand what does it mean to be inclusive. We need to understand that word, I think, to, to start with. Mm. So, so that's some thoughts I have, thanks. Thanks, Rosie. I think we might be able to come back to that point in a bit, actually. Um, okay, and then Alina, sorry, Alina, what you go? Well, within LGBTQI plus community, of course, we have a lot of yeah, different groups. Uh, it all has something to do with sexuality, with gender, with expression, with just how a body looks. And uh, those different groups have all different challenges uh, in sport. Uh, and I'm sure everyone knows that there's still a problem in, in sport for the, that community. But I'm, 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 I don't think that, that, that everyone knows that how big uh, this problem really is. In Europe, we see that uh, numbers um, are saying that more than 90% of young LGBTQI athletes can't be filmed themselves in sports. I'll say it again, more than 90%. It's, it's just a horrific figure. And it's not just a problem that, that's existing in, the, in their heads. It's, 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 it's existing because they were afraid, because there's just an unsafe situation in, in sports for a lot of them. And it's, it's not only the gay slurs on the training field and on the games and in the locker rooms. Uh, it's, it's, it's the whole atmosphere around it. And uh, that's only for, uh, about sexuality, but also for uh, transgender people, for non-binary people, for intersex people. They, they just find it very hard to find access to sports because uh, sports is, is fundament, fundamental. To, uh, it's, it's, it's organized in... in, in very binary categories of, of men and women. Of course, there are other examples and weight classes and, 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 and all other examples, but, but the most sports are very restricted in, in, in men and women. And when you, for example, when you're a non-binary person and you don't identify as a man or a woman and, or you just feel both or nothing at all, then you just literally don't have any choice and you're being cho forced to choose uh, a box. Uh, and for uh, intersex people and transgender people, there are many issues, of course, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. we'll get into that, I think. Alina, can I ask you to repeat that statistic again? So I think it's a very important one. Yeah, it's more than 90%. And I, I don't say 19, I say 90%. So it's, yeah, it's big. And uh, it's, it's just a figure. Young people come to us and, and we hear a lot of stories, but it's it's not something that's very visible for 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 clubs and you we also we all we hear a lot of times but we don't have any transgender people we don't have any gay people on our team it's just not an issue here mm -hmm. 
But that's the problem. I think if you don't have a transgender people or a gay person in your team, then you have a problem and there's something wrong in your club or in your team and you need to do some self-reflection. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I think what I'd like to do is spend some more time digging into how we can overcome these, these uh, issues for exclusion. But before we do, I think we have to uh, consider the pandemic. Uh, because I think we can also view that in maybe a positive light in terms of the learning that we can take from, from what's happened during the pandemic. So I'd like to ask you randomly, whoever wants to feel like they, they want to say something about it, how has the pandemic um, maybe highlighted your issue or even exacerbated it, made it, made it worse? Um, and, and then how can you kind of, how can we learn from that, from that being highlighted? So maybe who looked? I can, I can go. Again? Yeah. Well, four or five months ago, I started creating a women's football department in the second club I was talk talking about before that had no female members. And it was a plan I had in my head for a, maybe over a year when the pandemic really got stronger. And it got, it got to my mind because I realized, okay, we have the pandemic, lots of people's lives have stopped. I couldn't play football. My other ethnic Danish girlfriends could not play football, but what about the women in the area? How does their lives look? And it, I realized not a change was made. It was the same because they weren't already a part of different communities, different unions. So actually in that case, for my neighborhood, the pandemic and all the balls in the air that it froze and it stopped time made sure that we could catch up that we had the time to build what was not already there and to give the opportunities that were not already given so i think in in that sense and in that way it was like a time freezer and it you know made sure people could stand still take the time to look up and find out okay who are behind Instead of, you know, there is a lot of focus of all the things that are ongoing, the projects that do exist, people who do play sports, but it, you know, became a lot more easier and almost a benefit for people who were not already active. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, was, it was, had been referred to as the great pause. Yep. So you, you've given time to reflect. Brilliant answer. Thanks, Maggie. Anybody else want to take that on? I can share um, a sort of initiative that we did during this pandemic time that we also um, actually initiated for um, Women's International Day. And it was more around kind of public space and safety and women in public space. There'd been lots of cases, including a famous one in the UK of Sarah Everard and the murder in public space that she experienced and also some cases here and around Brussels. So I decided to kind of mix the two things of my background of sport and self-defense and connected with women in South Asia, Northern America, um, and also including our Laska from ISCA um, in Bulgaria. And we started an initiative of empowering women in public space, but also wanting to bring this in a local level to schools and educate and have girls in public space learning about self-defense. Yes, of course, we do know that, you know, it shouldn't be that women change their behavior in public space, and it's more about educating the men and boys. Um, but sadly, we're not living in that world. So it's also about encouraging women to take up self-defense. Mm. Um, and so it was also about education and that in inclusive public spaces? How do we create safe spaces for everybody? Um, and so, so that was an example, um, you know, that we started and we're really glad to continue that beyond that first initiative that we did. Thanks, Rosina. I'm gonna, I'm looking out into the audience now because we're, we're ready to take some questions if there are any. Um, we have people with microphones, I think on both sides. Um, Can I add something? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I just want to add something about the pandemic, which I also think is a huge lesson. We all could have learned that for almost an entire year, we in Denmark at least were in full lockdown. People who were going to their different sport activities, 
you know, the different things they were doing to have fun and like switch off all the thoughts and negativity, they weren't able to access it. And we all know that sucked. That wasn't nice. We were like hating it, only waiting for it all to open so we could go back. But imagine how people with a, you know, with less resources, people with a lower, you know, socioeconomical background, how must they feel when the opportunity is there, but they're not able to go from A to B because either they can't access or either it's too far away from the distance of their home or, you know, they have the same limitations we had under the pandemic, but for different reasons, not because of a rule and a disease, but because of their state of life and how, what can we do to help them? Even though COVID is over, what can we do to include them? We need to, you know, remember just because we can access and we are part of it, it's a huge privilege. The things we do, the things we think is easy might be a big, big barrier for someone else. And that's something, you know, we, all, we always need to have in mind. It's easy for me, but it's difficult for someone else. Mm -hmm. What can I do to make sure it's easy for everyone? Mm -hmm. Which kind of relates to Lucy's point about the unconscious bias. When you're designing programs, you're not often thinking about the, the, bound, the, the barriers that other people are having. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe just to add on to yeah, that. On, so, and I think it links with the, the, the spaces concept. So the thing that I'm most excited about is, and there are so many organizations in this room, Dolores in Madrid that we, that we spoke yesterday, um, I'm involved in a project in Catalonia with a fantastic uh, association called Ramasa. Um, they are, um, and, and Negan, your um, work in Denmark as well, they're, they're working directly with, um, in, in our case, young women and, and girls and understanding the realities, understanding the needs, um, reshaping sport based on those needs and realities, whether it's having um, childcare on the side of the field, whether it's um, having workshops with the, with the social workers and educators who are supporting the women in shelters. Um, and all of this is happening. And this is what gives me so much energy because you com come to a space like this where there are so many incredible activists and grassroots initiatives that are always, um, or oftentimes missed out from um, sort of being considered and being recognized and being counted as, as, as sport. And so they're happening in these informal spaces um, that there is a lot going on um, and, and yet they, they operate in, in these non-traditional ways. Um, so I think um, there's so much expertise of, of how to create this space, even within the space itself, designing methodologies and designing sports activities that ensure that every single person in the field is enjoying, is, is benefiting, is, is participating. Um, it, it comes back, it's, it's being purposeful and being intentional with, with the space once it's created. Mm. And I wanna come back to this. I wanna identify what these good practices are so that we can get to the point where in Rosina's case for her son, she can find a community club within a five mile radius of her home and she doesn't have to drive. You know, I wanna start speaking about it, but I wanna be inclusive as well. And I, want, I did see a hand up at one point over here, but I'm not sure if it's, yeah, okay, there's a hand here. Could you just say, first of all, just say your name and uh, before you ask the question, please. Hi, uh, Karine from the ITTF Foundation. Thanks a lot to the panel. It's really nice to have such a diversity uh, represented. And my question is more in terms of safe spaces. We also use the term a lot, but I feel like it's not necessarily always, we use a certain target group for, for this project design. So it will be refugees or it will be persons with disabilities. And I'm wondering, and I would love to hear from each one of you, what criteria would make up a safe space for you? Um, and just to see what commonalities there are for, for the design of an actually inclusive program. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Who wants to start with that? <clears throat> but what, what comes to my mind is, is, is that a lot of times when, when, when you talk about safe spaces, then people are a bit critical, uh, have, have an opinion about it and are saying, oh, why are you in, installing uh, places that are away and that are isolated from what's already existing? And what, why are you not just trying to collaborate with us? But what's important for LGBT 
uh, people uh, is uh, yeah, that safe space that they don't find in the mainstream organized sport. It's, it's for a reason that they need an, an, uh, an uh, sort of isolated space. They, uh, in the meantime, as long as it takes that we don't create with education and with, with all the steps that, and we're going in a, in a good way, I think. And I mean, until then, that, other, that teams and clubs are safe for people, then there needs to be other initiatives. Uh, and of course, I think the, the key factor is to do collaboration and to, to have uh, a sort of um, bridge with, uh, and what we try to do is to uh, involve professional athletes that who are role models uh, and who can give the confidence to young people to be active again in sport because they, they, they lost confidence. They, they just quit sport because they don't like it. Uh, and they didn't, didn't know why they should sport anymore. And with, with that collaboration, they can find their way back, hopefully to uh, yeah, existing clubs and teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, role models is a hard, hard one in your, in your area of work because there's so few people that have come out and are ready to speak about it. Anybody Can else? I say something about yeah. role models too? <laughs> and now you're talking about it. Keep going. Well, role models is super important. And of course, the story, storytelling part, and it, it's for all topics the, the same, I guess. But uh, what I think it's important that uh, you cannot lay full responsibilities to, into role models. You cannot just wait for a big soccer player to, to come out uh, in the Premier League, for example. And mm. we, we had a couple of re weeks back uh, a very brave soccer player uh, in Australia. Uh, but we cannot wait for that. They're just too, they're, they're afraid for a reason. And the responsibility is uh, with those people who have the power to change change things. And it's the structure that's, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does someone want to pick that up? Yep, um, I would just like to add, I think it's a big part of what you were saying earlier about the sort of co-design. It's about co-designing those safe spaces with a little bit of participatory design. And that means participating together with the community that is around you. Ask them and understand who they are. Ask them what their challenges are. What do they consider to be safe? And that's what you need to design around because the community themselves will come up with the challenge and they will have the solutions as well. So I think a big part of that inclusivity starts with asking your own community that you want to create the solution for, because they will have the answers. And um, when we're asking the community, are we talking about local groups? I mean, who do we go to? It's local groups and ensure that you have that um, diversity around the table. It doesn't need to be that everyone is from the sports sector. Absolutely not. I think it's also looking at different sectors and understanding um, you know, what, what their needs are. How can they contribute? How can they help? Um, and very much it's got to be at the local level um, of understanding. And also, you know, it's about the partnerships, about the private public, civic society organizations, having education, having health having all these different sectors around the table. Um, so, so you've got that, um, you know, it's already proven, I think, by McKinsey and various reports that the more diverse the, the, the input, the better the outcome. And I think that's the principle that we need to go by. Mm -hmm. There's a nice uh, sentence that goes with it, I think, and it's called nothing about us without us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for us, we very much focus on emotional um, safe spaces and, and, and emotional safety. So one of the just one of the very specific examples that I can share is that in our programs in Catalonia, we have um, social educators, social workers, individuals who are trained with a social background um, delivering our activities. Um, and so they come with that wider awareness of, of where a young person is coming from and what situation and what they're bringing to the field. And they're able to have um, socio-educational dynamics within the field to complement the sports uh, or the educational aspects. And, and yeah, this, it, this works, works really, really well for us. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we have a hand at the back there. <clears throat> Do we have a microphone? Can you, can you keep your hand up? Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, my name is Des, and uh, thanks for the panel. That's uh, very interesting. Um, the range of different um, groups that. Um, you're talking about in terms of inclusion. Um, it's a quick comment. I think it is important that um, that you have the right people involved in when you're designing sports programs or programs around physical activity. That's just key um, because you know if you have the right people involved, then you're going to get the outcome that uh, that they're looking for. I think my specific question is just one around um, whether or not the panel feels that th that different models can be used. So. Uh, mainstreaming, so people being involved in sport and physical activity in the mainstream, separate programs or a mix? Well, I would say all of them. Yeah, I think so too, but I think the mix is good. Because I think we want to have, you know, I think if it's completely separate, then it's not being inclusive. So I think we want to have that mix, um, to be honest. And that's what I would want for my son, for example. Dylan, did you want to say something? Yeah, I think uh, mainly toward what's the goal. So uh, more specialized, maybe it's maybe too practical, but uh, high performance athletes, maybe a specialized program going on like a Paralympic pathway. Whereas uh, more grassroots are creating this social inclusion, having uh, a mixed group is better to create this understanding between the two groups. That's, that's um, yeah, you on. know, I think, you know, in, in some ways mixed, mixed groups are good, but in the field where I work, for example, with girls and women's grassroots football, I think it's best to keep things separate for some. Of course, we have to focus on the equality and, you know, mix can be good mix is good to create understanding and build bridges between the different you know kinds of minorities but there are so many different levels where some are just best to keep apart i would have never been able to get so many girls and women out on the field if it weren't because it was separate so i think we need to take the needs into consideration every time we're in a field i agree with that actually for the women and girls it's I think there's certainly more um, outreach um, and more sort of motivation for them to join when it's sometimes just for women and girls. Especially because it's so so new still. If it was going on for a, a much longer time and period, okay, maybe we could start talking about mix, but when even women's football is not on the same level as men's football yet, talking about exposure and stuff like that, then I think it's best to keep it apart because some people still need to be attracted by it. And the only way they can get attracted is by feeling safe, by getting that sense of you're able to be yourself. You're able to, if you want, play in a skirt and a hijab. And if you don't want to wear that, you wear shorts and you wear whatever you want because it's only girls and you can do what you want. And maybe then in a couple of years, you're ready to take the next steps and play with the boys. Yeah, I really agree with that. I really think it builds on the last question of creating the safe spaces and kind of which lens or area of safety, physical safety, social safety, uh, this uh, into how you design programs or implement the groups. And speaking of safe, safe spaces, I think it's, it's, fu it's funny that that word even exists because everywhere should be a safe space. We should be able to feel comfortable being a part of every community and every society. So even the need of safe spaces in small, you know, different unions is, you know, something we need to work on. We, we do not want different safe spaces. We want one big safe space and that should be our society. But unfortunately it's not that way. So we have to take it step by step because there are so many different, you know, levels. 
Carol, I have a question. Is this is this correct, or do I have eight to seven minutes left? It's correct. This is correct. Okay. This is correct. Yes. So we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, what I want to ask you, actually, is for you is for you to really wrap up. I think it's best if we if we leave this session with uh, an idea of what we can take away. So so let's let's assume that people out there are project implementers. What is it that you'd like them to remember from this discussion when they're next uh, building, their, building their next project? And maybe we can kind of leave it to one sentence, um, one main principle from each of you, please. Should we, should we start with Arlene, please? I, I would say that don't think that uh, an, a plan like an anti-discrimination plan or a diversity plan or an inclusion plan or how do you want to call it don't think that one plan will solve all problems and will work for all uh, groups that you're not uh, including right now in your top of your team it's 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 very important to to use specific terms and to 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 give recognition to those groups that are, are not feeling safe to come to your sport right now. So I would say that's important. Uh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. For me, I think it's the kind of co-designing with empathy with the community, really stepping in their shoes and having this collaborative mindset and bringing people that you wouldn't normally bring around the table to the table and giving them a seat and um, giving them a voice and really taking on board what they say and try and design your programs, your club, whatever you're doing around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think my takeaway would be that let's broaden the definition of sport, my sport, um, my whole life has been football, but football takes so many different forms. It's not just the traditional boring, you know, weekly trainings, weekend matches. It takes place in so many different forms and we need to identify that, celebrate that, um, uh, document and, and raise awareness and congratulate everybody for, um, for bringing and, and creating and molding the sport that suits everybody. For me, my takeaway would be along the lines of uh, COVID, or as we're redesigning programs or reinventing programs, or many of us in the room, we really had to rethink uh, physically or physical safety, how to have hand washing stations or things like this. But hopefully, in the future, it could um, allow you to have this lens uh, a bit of what we talked about of creating a safe space, reevaluating our programs and how they're implemented, not only in physically safety or combating COVID, COVID countermeasures, but uh, addressing the social safety, psychological uh, and physical beyond COVID. Mm -hmm. Invest in girls and women's football, not only in terms of economy, but with your trust, give girls and women, and especially with minority background, obviously that's my case, give them your trust, give them a seat at the table, hear them and take action out of what they say because you know, sometimes we might know something. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Nagin. Thank you, all of our panelists. It's been really insightful for me and I hope also for our audience. I think I'd like to thank the MOVE Congress organizers for bringing this panel together so that we can, we can hear from their different ideas. And uh, I guess what I would take from it is, the, is Arlena's quote earlier. Uh, I know it's not yours, but you, may, you brought our attention to it, which is nothing about us without us. I think from what, what all of you are saying there, that quote holds true, um, if I may. So thank you very much. And thank, thanks, everybody here for a great session. Thank you.